Last week and so far this week, you've learned about requirements one and two of a battery management system, which have to do with sensing and high voltage control and protection. In this lesson, we're going to consider requirement three, which has to do with interface between the battery management system and the host application. This includes the communications itself. It also possibly includes controlling a charger, data recording for diagnostics purposes, and it can include auxiliary tasks such as range estimation. Let's first think about how the BMS communicates with the host application. There are many ways of doing this, but a very common approach that's used in a lot of applications is the Control Area Network, or CAN, bus, which is an industry standard way of communicating. In the automotive application, it's the universal way of communicating between electronic components in the vehicle. The CAN bus specification is designed to provide robust communications between two processors in a very demanding and harsh automotive environment where there are high levels of electrical noise. It's already used in conventional vehicles where these noises come from spark plugs firing, for example, and so it's a natural choice when moving to electric drivetrains where there's also a significant amount of electrical noise generated by the electronics that drive the power uh, for the electrical motors. The CAN bus uses two wires and communicates in a serial fashion one bit at a time between the two processors. It's designed to network intelligence sensors and actuators and processors together, and it's able to operate at two rates simultaneously. One of these rates we would consider a high-speed rate. It might be around 1 million bits per second, or roughly 1 million baud. The high-speed operation is used for critical things such as engine management and vehicle stability and motion control, and things that are performance critical and safety critical. The low speed operation might work at 100,000 bits per second or roughly 100,000 baud, for example. The low speed CAN bus might be used for simple switching, uh, control of lighting, operation of power windows and mirror adjustments and instrument displays and other functions where the safety and performance are not as time critical. The CAN bus protocol defines how to transmit information between two different entities connected on the bus in the following way. It gives a method to address the messages to a specific destination device connected to the bus. It defines the data format to be used in the message. It defines the transmission speed of the high speed and the low speed aspects of the protocol. It also defines priority settings for a message being transmitted on the bus, and it defines sequencing of messages and responses. It also talks about how to detect errors and how to handle those in order to get retransmissions so that we are able to communicate everything that we desire to communicate. And it defines some control signals. I've illustrated the format of one frame of a CAN bus message on this slide. The frame begins with a single bit that's a start of frame or SOF marker. Then there's a 29-bit identifier for the address of the recipient of the message. Then there's one bit ready to receive or RTR field. And this is followed by a six-bit control field that describes what this message is all about. The main part of the message is a data field with the information that is to be transmitted across the, the wire across the bus from the transmitter to the intended recipient, and this data field can have a length of anywhere between 0 and 8 bytes. This is followed by a checksum that's used to detect whether there have been any transmission errors in the message, and this checksum is often called a cyclic redundancy check or a CRC check. The next field is a 2-bit acknowledgement field that's used to acknowledge correct receipt of a message, and finally the message concludes with a 7-bit end of frame or EOF, which is combined with the one, which when combined with the 1-bit uh, start of frame puts bookends on the message so that the recipient knows that the entire message has been received correctly. These data frames are transmitted sequentially over a bus that's shared between many, many devices, and when data frames are successfully received, an acknowledgement is sent back. 
Uh, if a data frame is not received at all, there will be no acknowledgement, and so after some timeout period, it's retransmitted. If the data frame has been received correctly, then the acknowledgement will be sent back to the original sender, and so the sender knows there's no need to retransmit. One application that requires the battery pack to communicate with the outside world is when the battery pack is being charged. Battery packs are charged generally in two different ways. One way is what I will call random charging. This is when charge is delivered in unpredictable patterns to the battery pack from the host application. In a vehicle this happens when the driver presses the brake pedal and instead of using the friction brakes it's possible to use the, uh, the, the motor, the, put the braking energy through the motor back into the battery pack to uh, add charge to the battery pack. And this recovers some of the energy that would otherwise be lost and improves the efficiency of the vehicle. Now, of course, in a vehicle you still need the redundant friction brakes, and so regener regenerative braking is used for only a portion of the overall braking need, but it does help to increase efficiency. Control of random charging is done by providing the host application with charge power limits that must be obeyed at all points in time. And these power limits are dynamic in the sense that they change as the state and the environment of the battery pack changes. And so the battery management system must continually calculate how much recharge the power, uh, power the pack can safely accept and then transmit these limits to the host application. The second type of charging is what I'll call plug-in charging, and this is used uh, in an electric vehicle that could be connected to the electric power grid. Um, so this includes uh, pure electric vehicles, of course, and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and extended range electric vehicles. In these applications, it's possible to communicate directly from the battery pack through the host application to the charger to control the charger's output current or power more directly. So the battery management system uh, can then ensure that the voltage of the charger meets certain requirements and it can conduct balancing of the different battery cells and of the battery pack while charging is happening. The mode of plug-in charging often follows what we call a constant power constant voltage mode which we saw a number of weeks ago in this course. Uh, there are more exotic methods that are possible and it's my belief that future electric vehicle charging will be optimized in order to charge the battery pack quickly and safely and that this optimization process will turn out to be somewhat different from standard constant power constant voltage charging. Lithium ion cells can safely accept much faster charging when they are warm than when they are cold and so some battery management systems implement heating uh, that activates when the vehicle is being charged when it's plugged in. The heating system is powered directly from the grid and so battery energy is not wasted in order to activate this, these heaters. And uh, so the heating system makes the battery pack last longer in the sense that it can charge more quickly without causing damage, uh, which is a huge advantage of course. While we're talking about charging, I would like to perform a really fun thought experiment with you. One of the things that's limiting consumer acceptance of electric vehicles is the rate at which they can be recharged. Uh, so we might want to consider what limits that rate. Let's think about this. First we need to think about how much energy is required when we're charging the battery pack. And it turns out that most passenger vehicles of moderate size require between 200 to 300 watt hours per mile traveled. And this is a value that we can verify in, at the end of the second course in the specialization. So if we desire a 300 mile range, the battery pack must have between 60 to 90 kilowatt hours of capacity. If we're to charge the entire battery pack in three minutes, which is roughly the time it takes to fill a gasoline tank of a standard automobile, then it would require power transfer at the rate of about 1.8 megawatts, and that's an enormous amount of power. So instead of thinking about what's required to charge in three minutes, let's think from the other point of view of how much power is commonly available. In the United States, in a household standard circuit, electrical power is provided at 110 volts AC and 15 amperes. And this is roughly 1.5 kilowatts, and uh, charging at this rate is termed level 1 charging. A level 1 circuit then is able to recharge the battery pack in about 40 to 60 hours. 
and clearly that's far too long. Uh, so we must consider other levels of power that might be available. Again, in the United States, it's also quite common for households to have specialty circuits for the electric uh, stove um, and for electric clothes dryers that operate at 220 volts AC and between 30 and 40 amperes. Uh, this corresponds to about 6.6 .6 kilowatts and this type of charging is called level 2 charging. Level 2 charging is able to recharge a battery pack of this size in between 10 to 15 hours. So that's still very long, but clearly it's far better than level 1 charging. And in fact, since most people don't drive 300 miles every day, level 2 charging is generally considered sufficient for most vehicle applications unless you happen to be driving very long distances between two destinations. And so there's something called level 3 charging, which presently exists in multiple forms. One uses direct current and operates up to a limit of around 500 volts and about 125 amperes. This can charge up to a battery pack up to about 80% state of charge in about 30 minutes. Tesla has implemented their own proprietary level 3 fast charging system for their Model S and that can provide about 50% state of charge in about 20 minutes. So you see that in most cases the limit to how quickly we charge a battery pack is not truly the battery chemistry. Instead it's the electrical service to which the battery pack is connected. Uh, but it's also true that the battery can limit charge rates, especially at low temperatures and at high states of charge. So present research on fast charging is concentrating on how can we accelerate that final 20% of charge and how can we safely charge a battery pack at low temperatures. A third function that I associate with the communication requirement of the battery management system is that of maintaining a logbook. For warranty and for diagnostic purposes, the battery management system should store a permanent record of unusual or abuse events. This record should include a description of what the abuse was, such as whether it was a measurement that was out of tolerance or whether there was some overvoltage or undervoltage or whether too much current uh, was measured or, or something like that. It should also measure the duration of the abuse event and the magnitude of the abuse event. Since an overvoltage event of one microsecond is probably not a major concern, but an overvoltage of one minute could quite easily be a significant concern. This logbook can also store diagnostic information that is not directly related to any unusual event, but it could be useful in determining how this battery pack has been used over time. It can store the number of charge and discharge cycles completed. It can store the state of health estimates at the beginning or ending of every drive cycle. And it could store just about anything you can think of that should be maintained between uh, one point in time and another point in time, such as when the battery pack is removed from the load and when it's reconnected to the load. This record is stored in non-volatile memory. Uh, for example, flash memory, such as used in solid-state drives in your laptop or on a USB thumb drive. Uh, these data can be transmitted to the host application when required, but many battery management systems have secondary diagnostic interfaces so that a technician is able to access the data directly without requiring a path through the host application to do so. This way the technician can determine directly from the battery management system the information that's required to diagnose a problem and which can lead to some ability to correct the problem. There are other tasks a battery management system might do in cooperation with the host application. These would tend to be more application specific and the one that I talk about here briefly applies to electric vehicles. In that case, the host application might require the battery management system to compute an estimate of the present remaining range of the vehicle based on the amount of energy remaining in the battery pack. Uh, this, however, turns out to be a quantity that's heavily influenced by environmental factors such as what are the vehicle characteristics and how is the vehicle being driven and what is the surrounding terrain, such as are there many hills? Will I be going up or down a lot? Uh, what is the weather like? Uh, you know, is there a lot of snow on the ground that's causing friction, or is there a lot of wind that's either impeding or helping progress? 
It even matters whether the ambient temperature is warm or cold and how the vehicle will operate. So range estimation is very difficult. It depends not only on how much energy is available on the battery, but also on the characteristics that are truly known only by the host application. And so at this point in history, it appears to me at least that every automotive manufacturer will have their own range estimation algorithms. But uh, again, in the next specialization towards the end, we will see how to simulate an electric vehicle as an example battery load. And you'll be able to see perhaps how range estimation might be done. At this point in the specialization, it's sufficient to know that the battery management system must at least produce the inputs to these algorithms and especially for the range estimation algorithm how much energy is presently available in the battery pack. And so to summarize this lesson you've learned that a battery management system must communicate critical information about the present operating condition of the battery pack to the host application. This is very often done using a CAN bus protocol, and since CAN bus electronics are implemented in hardware already on many, many microcontrollers that are available off the shelf, this is not a difficult thing to do. The communication needs and requirements tend to be application specific, but there are some common features. The battery management system must often give information about how to control the battery pack charging system in order to avoid safety hazards. The battery management system must often maintain a logbook of unusual or abusive events. The battery management system may also be required to perform application-specific tasks that might include computing an estimate of how much available range is left or distance to empty estimate for an electric vehicle. And of course, the battery management system must communicate to the host application estimates of available energy and available power and states of charge and states of health and so forth. And so we will begin to consider the estimates that a battery management system must provide to the host application in the next lesson.